Um, so yeah, we're gonna jump right into our um, next presenter, Chad King. Um, so let me give you a Chad. Let me give you a nice little intro here. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, Chad will recount how during a remotely operated vehicle dive in 2018, more than two miles deep near an extinct volcano called Davidson Seamount in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, scientists stumbled upon more than a thousand female brooding octopus, um, all kind of continuously bathing in warm seawater at basically the cracks um, of what we've discovered um, towards the bottom or at the bottom. Um, after returning in 2019 to further study the octopus garden, a fresh whale carcass uh, was also discovered, which has greatly contributed to the understanding of these unique, rarely before seen deep sea ecosystems off of our coast. So please welcome Chad King. Thanks, Amity. So yeah. Here to talk about octopus gardens. Uh, we did uh, kind of name it in lieu of the, the Beatles song with Ringo Starr taking lead there. So hopefully there's no trademark infringement that I'll have to pay for. So um, I've been with the sanctuary for a little over 17 years now, and I was classically trained as really a kelp forest um, biologist. And so most of my experience in the past has been scuba diving up and down this great coast that we have inside the sanctuary, um, helping the state. I used to work for Fishing Game in, in my prior job before that. Uh, established the MPAs that were, that were put in in 2007, inside and outside of reserves to kind of count and enumerate the fish, algae, and invertebrates. And so that's kind of been more of my uh, classic background. And, and a lot of underwater photography as well, uh, which you see here, and even on our Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring Network website, sanctuarymonitoring.org, got to put in the plug for that. We do have a photo database where we have over 5,000 photos totally free for non-commercial use. So you can check that out. And uh, created an app for iPhone and Android called C-Photo, where many of these photos are also available there as well. But just to kind of really take a big step back to kind of the beginning, I know that when I talk to a lot of my family and friends about the work that we've been doing lately, uh, I take for granted that when you're working in this environment, you become accustomed to proximity, distance, depth, and all those things make sense in any line of work that you do, uh, that you come home and kind of maybe describe to your, to your uh, friends and family. They may not understand some of the, the basics. So I wanted to kind of take a step back there just to kind of uh, give an idea of how large these areas that we're talking about are. Now, of course, uh, yeah, Paul was talking about the earth being mostly covered with water. I think we've all known that since uh, grade school. But when you consider the three-dimensional aspect of the oceans itself, because things live in the water column, uh, but here on land, they don't typically live in the air. They fly and move in the air, but they don't stay in the air. So when you consider the volume of water, over 99% um, of that is the living space on all of Earth. So it's really most of the, the habitat that the Earth uh, has to offer, and we don't live there. Uh, still to this date, around 95% of the oceans have been unexplored. Um, some of it's been mapped to a certain extent, but as far as actually getting in there and looking at things, um, we haven't, we haven't uh, barely scratched the surface. So as far as depth is concerned, this is kind of a PowerPoint slide showing the scale of the surface at the top down to the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest point in all of the world's oceans at over 11,000 meters. So this is kind of a little step-by-step -step of, of kind of seeing relative depths. So the red line that still appears at the surface is basically the limits of scuba diving. And so typically it's about 40 meters, 130 feet, unless you get into technical diving. So again, we can barely penetrate um, the depths of the ocean. The Eiffel Tower is represented there, a little graphic, 350 meters. That's how far it would be down in the ocean, roughly. Nuclear submarines can go to about 500 meters or so. Sperm whales can dive to about 1,000 meters. And well past, before this, there's no more light here because we do have some more plankton in the water. It's not as clear as the tropics. Light pretty much is gone by 200, 300 meters in depth. So most of the ocean, of course, is in perpetual darkness. Uh, the depth of the Grand Canyon, about 1,800 meters, so still not even halfway down. Uh, where we went, what I'm going to talk about today, was roughly 32 to 3,300 meters. Uh, and it's still not half as deep as the Mariana Trench, uh, but we're talking about two miles. So this is significantly deep and some of the deepest parts of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which 
the average depth of the world's oceans is actually still slightly deeper at about 3,700 meters. Uh, there's a lot of deep sea that's just sitting out there in the abyssal plain. Uh, and then the deepest part of the sanctuary is a little tiny corner of uh, Davidson Seamount Management Zone at almost 4,000 meters. So we almost are at that depth. And then as far as the tallest mountain in the world, still not as deep as the deepest ocean in the world uh, at 8,800 meters there, almost 8,900 meters. So just give kind of, kind of a concept of, of how deep we went. So here's a map of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, it was established in 1992, designated then. It's almost 6,000 square miles. Uh, we do deal with a lot of different habitats, including the 276 miles of shoreline, all the way, so we you know, deal with tidelands, wetlands, the shoreline intertidal, all the way out to the depths I'm going to be talking about today. So it's a complex array of habitats that the sanctuary is trying to manage uh, and characterize over all the years. And we have a very limited budget and limited staff, so we do what we can with not only our tools, but also this great diversity and, and richness of marine research institutions and organizations that we have around the crescent of Monterey Bay. Uh, Davidson Seamount in the lower left there, uh, it was actually added to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in 2008. Uh, we discovered lots of large and long-lived corals and sponges there, uh, and we thought, boy, we really should probably try to set this aside and protect it from future potential harm. And although right now it may not be uh, financially feasible to go down and mine things on the seamount, in the future it will be, and they've actually started deep sea mining operations around the world to collect things like man manganese uh, nodules, which accrete over rocks and, and those kinds of things in the deep sea. But also there's a lot of precious corals down there, including black corals that could, in theory, be harvested in the future. So the idea was, let's set it aside now before it conflicts with any financial interests of those that, that may do so in the future. So Davidson Seamount itself is an extinct volcano that last erupted about uh, 9.8 million years ago. And um, it's about 26 miles long. So if you think about being here in Monterey, if you look across to Santa Cruz on a clear day, I think it's clear enough today, that's about how long Davidson is. It's about 26 miles across the bay. Uh, eight miles wide and about seven plus thousand feet tall. So it's about as tall as Donner Summit when you're driving over the summit to get to your skiing destination, uh, just to give you a concept of how tall this thing is. Um, and even though we haven't been there that much, people haven't been there that often, relative to other seamounts in the world, it is one of the best studied ones. So here's just a quick clip of some of the things you might see down at Davidson. This is a bubblegum coral called Paragorgia. And these things can span wider than three meters, taller than three meters. They're, they're quite majestic and amazing, and they support a wide diversity of animals that live on and around them. Many other different types of corals there that are uh, just as big. Uh, and some corals have been, uh, there was a gold coral off of uh, Hawaii that was found to live 4,000 years, 4,000 years old. So we know that some of these corals can live a very, very long time. So it was imagery like this um, that really led to the addition of Davidson Seamount to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This is just a collage of a lot of the other different types of corals and animals and sponges. I mean, I, I think, especially with the bright pinks and yellows and everything like that, it's kind of Dr. Seuss-like, you know? Uh, when we go down there, it really is a colorful environment, even though it's in perpetual darkness. This is way below where light can penetrate. It's near freezing, you know, about one to two degrees Celsius, just above freezing. Uh, but it's just an incredible place and, and so interesting to uh, go to. So, let me go to the next slide. Sanctuary program, ONMS as a whole, uh, we had an agreement with Ocean Exploration Trust, which was started by Dr. Bob Ballard, and he's the guy who discovered the Titanic uh, in the 80s. And so he has this uh, program called Ocean Exploration Trust, and they use this research vessel called the Nautilus, the Exploration Vessel Nautilus. And they have a program where they go out with two remotely operated vehicles pictured here, and they explore the deep into areas that have never been explored before. But the really cool thing about their outfit is that they broadcast all of their dives live via satellite and over the internet. So anyone from the public can just tune in when they're out to sea, and, and except for the 30-second you know, delay from transmitting, they're seeing live exploration on the seafloor. And so that's what's really cool is they come along with us. The public comes along with us. We also have experts that maybe we didn't have enough berths on the, the vessel that can tune in live, and there's a special science chat room, so they can go, oh, I know what species that is. Oh, can you collect that rock for me? So we have an extension of scientists that can contribute, uh, which was extremely integral for this last cruise I'm going to talk about. 
Um, so it's just a wonderful outfit. So we had an agreement, a uh, financial agreement with Ocean Exploration Trust and the Sanctuary Program to go out and explore several of our marine sanctuaries. So real quickly, this is how the system works. The uh, Nautilus itself, of course, has a bunch of information that it ascertains via satellite for GPS. It knows its pitch and roll and all that stuff. So it has two ROVs, not just one. The first ROV uh, is called Argus, and that acts as the clump weight, because as the, the ocean moves up and down, it's going to pull on that stuff. So it acts as a clump weight, and then it's loosely attached via cable to the main workhorse, uh, which is uh, Hercules, the yellow sub right there, the yellow ROV right there. So they work in tandem and through a system of uh, transceivers and software and all the magic that goes behind the scenes that I don't understand, they know within a couple of meters where these ROVs are on the seafloor. So when we have maps, we can go out and plan our dives and then they have real-time telemetry and so we can navigate to these features and come back to these features uh, years later. So it's just as good as uh, using a GPS on land. Uh, and then all of us are comfortably sitting, sipping coffee up at a control room. Uh, but we do all have headsets on and we talk to one another, but all of that talking is also broadcast over the internet unless you turn yourself off. So you have to be very careful with the words that you choose because <laughs> it is out to the public. And we have a host, a science communication fellow from Nautilus who basically is the MC, introducing everyone. And we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week while we're on this boat in four hour shifts. So I would take like the 12 to four, so that's 12 to 4 p.m., 12 to 4 a.m. Uh, and in between, you try to get all the other stuff done, you know, uh, eat, exercise, sleep, do everything you can. But the science is great because we are in the water 24-7, and I'll show you here, we had three dives. All three of them were 30 hours long, so the ROVs were in for more than a full day. So this was part of the Nautilus Live program two years ago in 2018, and this just shows some of the sites that they visited. And these are not all sanctuary-sponsored uh, ones, but you can see Monterey Bay there in the center. Uh, we also went down to the, uh, the South Pacific as well, to our other uh, uh, sanctuary out there, and a couple other sites. And recently they've been using the Nautilus, I don't know if you saw the National Geographic special, uh, looking for Amelia Earhart's plane. That was a two hour special, it was pretty cool. Spoiler, they didn't find it, but I don't think that, uh, that was a surprise. So a couple of years ago, uh, we planned these dives um, at Davidson Seamount. Now where we had gone before is really all over, let's see if this mouse works here, is all over the summit of the seamount and up its flanks. And that's where we've kind of been and we know what to expect. But this was a little bit more about exploration. So we had the idea of like, well, there, there seems to be some hard rock and some reef and outcrops around the base of the seamount. No one's ever been there. And most people don't care to look at that. They might think it's boring, flat. Maybe there will be corals and sponges, maybe not as majestic, what have you. But it was important to us to look within the sanctuary at these new areas. So as you can see, the map is, map is blown up on the right. That's um, our ROV track line from two years ago. And so these are the kind of features that are resolved uh, via multi-beam um, data. So basically the ship will go over an area, shoot sound waves to the seafloor, it comes back in differing speeds, then they can calculate the depth with the XY position, and you get a virtual picture of the seafloor. So that's what we're using to find structures saying, oh, hey, coral grows on hard rock, so let's look for the hard rock. So that was the idea, just to go get corals and sponges. But then this happened at the very end of a 30-hour dive. Little spiral snail so shells. The oh, there's oh, some there's eggs. Some right eggs. A lot of eggs. Uh, that in the cen oh, wow. center one. Yeah. It's moving its so tentacles a lot. Yeah, let's Chapman. get a shot so of that, too. Yeah. This is great. Oh, yep, she has <laughs> eggs. Oh, yeah. Is this enough octopus for you, Joe? I could not have asked for Look how shiny more. those eggs are. Yeah, well, this is very interesting. So I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but um, are these likely male or female doing the brooding? Uh, likely female. So as we went along, we would find them in these obvious linear and uh, pool-like aggregations. They are certainly associated. Oh, and here's a shot from Argus, the upper ROV, which is also really great. It can give you some of these con contextual perspective shots of the lower ROV. 
But as we went up the side, we started seeing more and more and more and more. And more. Uh, what the process is for pulling stills, but uh, not Ooh. from this desk here. And then there's an octopus that's settling um, down. I like to take screenshots for stills while we're sampling and also whenever we see anything interesting. And also just occasionally to show the landscape of what we're passing over. So there's like three rivers flowing into this one here, three rivers of octopus. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that that barren side maybe. Yeah. Now we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like zoom in and see if there's any more shimmer. That seems more prominent than the oh, last yeah. location. We could see some of the shimmering, like you would on a hot summer day off the pavement. That is just basically the density difference of warmer water coming up and affecting how light transmits through it. And so right away we're like, oh my God, this is now warm water too which was another important discovery. That's never been found in the, the area. And in fact, when I was corresponding with um, a geologist at uh, Imbari, they were like, it, c it can't be warm because the place has been geologically dead for almost 10 million years. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have access to our thermometer, <laughs> our temperature probe, but we were gonna come back right away. And unfortunately, you could just see there, just lines and lines of octopus. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had some technical issues with the fiber optics and we lost the entire rest of the cruise and we could not come back to this place. And it was just killing me. But that's okay because we still were able to get back later. And so here's just some shots in case the video had failed. Um, but what's also of note is, of course, the octopus are the most uh, distinguishable or obvious thing. But you can see anemones, these little small snails. And as you zoom in and, and look around, you see little amphipods, limpets, uh, little shrimp, a, a nice little community that are clearly associated with these seeps that are not found outside of the seeps. I'm not saying that all of them are seep dependent or endemic to seeps, but there certainly is some sort of interaction or reason why all these animals are here. Um, and certainly the number one question were, why are all these female octopuses coming in they glue their eggs to the rock with uh, uh, a cement that they produced with one of their glands. Uh, and we've had clutches of more than 60, 70 eggs with any particular female. Um, what's also really interesting is uh, deep sea octopuses and deep sea biology in general takes a lot longer to happen because it's colder and biological processes, metabolism and everything like that happens at a much slower pace. So things are typically long lived and things take a lot longer like brooding. So Mbari followed another species of deep sea octopus and it took that um, female 54 months, four and a half years before her eggs hatched. Um, we don't know the time for these guys yet, uh, but we know that they're gonna be longer than let's say your giant Pacific octopus that we're all familiar with here that takes three months for their eggs to hatch. So everything happens at a much slower pace in the deep sea. Now the question is, are these guys here all the time? How long do they take to brood? What is it about the warm water or something in the water that attracts them, and do they have any viable offspring? Because there's only been one other place in the entire world where something similar to this was found, and that was off the coast of Costa Rica. And they had mild temperatures. They only had about 150 individuals. Here it was well over 1,000. And they had been back several times with the Alvin, and they have never seen any development in the eggs. No eye spots, no arms, no tentacles, and they've never seen anyone hatch. So their theory, because they measured the water coming out, is that it was uh, lower oxygen, which it was, it was lower dissolved oxygen. So they thought these mothers are just sentencing their babies to death, essentially, because there's not enough oxygen to support development. So we were hoping that wasn't the case here, but we were here for maybe 30 to 45 minutes. So we didn't really have a chance to get back until later. <laughs> Some more shots there of them just lining up in these obvious uh, cracks where water is, is seeping out. Um, and then something else happened. This is not relative. Well, to the look, octopus. we got a little octopus up in the corner.
machine, put it out, and we got lots and lots of views. But that's great, because we want people to come and explore with us, and this is really important stuff. Even though a Dumbo octopus in itself is not a significant find, they're very common, but running into them is really, really cool. Um, so again, I was talking about the, the press, OET's press machine in Amity was on both cruises. She was a part of this too. Um, so many interviews with National Geographic and the whole list is here. Lots of web traffic. It was great getting the sanctuary's name out, getting what we're doing out there. And that's really the bottom line is making people aware of the great work that is, that is happening. So as I addressed some of these questions before, these are kind of just the initial list. There's many more, I'm sure, that, that we have in our back pocket. But at that time, we didn't know, is the water warm? Is it also lower in oxygen like the, it is in Costa Rica? Is the water chemistry the same? How is it changing as it travels under the earth? Why are the octopus there? Do they successfully reproduce? What are the roles of the other animals in those seeps? And are there more places like this? Or do we just find the only one that's around? So the idea uh, in, you know, because I'm not a geologist, um, but I've been working with one on this project, and their, their theory is that it's a low temperature ridge flank hydrothermal system, that's a mouthful. Essentially, the Davidson Seamount is made out of volcanic rock, it's basalt, that means it's porous. So water can actually go right through it and will travel underneath the top of the lith uh, lithosphere, basically the top of the Earth's crust underneath the sediment and will escape in pressure gradients, the differential, so it'll escape just like you would out of a tube of toothpaste or something. But it's been slightly warmed as it travels close to the uh, top of the Earth's crust, uh, not by much, um, and then, of course, the seawater chemistry will be a little bit different as well. So that was, that was the idea. And as far as it confirmed low temperature um, hydrothermal um, ridge flank system, this would be only the third one described in the world. So we're working on that right now as well. So Blue Planet Live um, was this great week-long uh, event that BBC put on just in the UK and Canada. And they were looking for places to transmit live via satellite from around the world. They went down to Baja. They were in Australia at the Great Barrier Reef. And so when they got word of this, they wanted to come out on the Atlantis and dive at the Octopus Garden. And this was this past March. And so they invited me along. And uh, the, the PI on the cruise, they were going to go down to Costa Rica, agreed to add four days. And so we went off the coast on the uh, research vessel Atlantis. And that's a picture of the Alvin there. Um, after its 5,000th dive sometime last year. Um, it's been around since 1964, I believe. Um, and I told my wife, I'm going to be going down in that. She's like, boy, you said it was built in 1964. So it's been updated since then. Don't worry about it. New sphere on there. So uh, it was a really exciting opportunity uh, to get out there. And so here's just some video of um, kind of the whole process. It's our camera crew there. And that's how big the Alvin is. It's actually quite large. It's about big for man. Stairs, crawling. That's the PI. So, um, it gets lowered in. There's swimmers that uh, unattach the element from uh, the vessel itself, and then it starts a descent. Now, of course, we're at one atmosphere the entire way. It's a pressurized sphere, so we don't have to worry about decompression or things that scuba divers need to worry about. But when we got down there in March, we saw the shimmering fluid again, and the BBC and everybody else was relying on my guess that they Can't tell if that's a male or female looking for a spot. shot of the eggs there. Now these are fairly young eggs because uh, you didn't see any eye spots or anything in them. Again, more of the shimmering. And then look in the lower left. We have viable reproduction. Very excited to see that. We, we, we were like just losing our minds in the sub. So yes, uh, they do have the
79 degrees C in diffuse flow here. The knees trim it up, and then we're going to head over to the uh, to recover the trap. So you heard it there from Bruce. Yeah. We just got down oh. 3,200 meters here at the Octopus Garden, and we ran right into some shimmering flow. And they did a great job getting the temperature probe in, and we got a high temperature of 7.79 degrees C. So pretty awesome. Definitely warm here. Celsius uh, by the to clutches of eggs where you can see the little eye spots and in other resolved pictures you can see their, their tentacles and everything, their arms I should say. Uh, so it's like okay, this place is a viable uh, reproductive uh, population. So since then, and I'll get to the latest cruise, um, we went Nautilus, we were there for one hour, Alvin a combined eight hours, and then we're working with Imbari and Dr. Jim Barry and we were able to do two single day trips uh, bottom time of three hours and six hours. But again, if you add it all up, it's still relatively little time that we've spent on the site. So when we docked in San Pedro in October of 2018, and we had lost really the entire cruise from technical problems, uh, Bob Ballard came aboard, shook my hand right away, and said, you get a do-over. So he actually volunteered some of his time, some of the boat time, uh, from the upcoming 2019 season and essentially gave us a do-over because, um, you know, the tech broke. And so he was like, yeah, you can get a few days back. So that was the idea this past year in October is we went back out uh, to the Davidson. And this time we visited the Octopus Garden again, which is listed down in the southern part here with all the black lines and red dots. And the idea now was to not only mow the lawn to see how um, large the extent of the population is, but also to lay down temperature loggers, oxygen loggers, and um, something called an osmo sampler, where it samples a little bit of water every single day over a period of time. And when we collect that, now we can look at the seawater chemistry changing over a weekly, daily period. Uh, same with the temperature and oxygen loggers, too. It's not just a, a, a discrete temperature measurement at that moment, but now we'll see the ups and downs of it over a period of a year, uh, which is when we're planning to go back out. And we also, for the next dive, uh, explored this uh, cliff-like feature, uh, looking for, again for more corals and sponges. And then we wanted to go up to this little volcanic cone, and the idea was, again, what if we find a second octopus garden? That would be fantastic. It would only be the third in the world. And then maybe this is a much more common thing than we actually previously thought. And so we did go down with a um, temperature oxygen monitor so we could read real time into these seeps. That's the Osmo sampler that we left uh, down there, um, and still down there to this day. Uh, and then we had something called squeeze samplers. And so these are basically large syringes. When the ROV uh, manipulator arm closes it, it'll just suck up the water and seal it off so we can get a discrete measure or a sample of the seawater that's coming out of the seafloor, bring it up, and then the uh, water chemist can analyze that later. Oh, this is, uh, I didn't put the video in here. It is online if you check out Nautilus Live on YouTube. They have a whole assortment of videos here. But this was of one of those shrimps. Now, they did witness these shrimp trying to attack and eat these octopus eggs down in Costa Rica. So that was the idea here, but we hadn't seen it yet. Uh, well, it happened. Uh, one of the mothers had been disturbed. It exposed her clutch. And immediately, well, I should say within a few minutes, the shrimp came down and actually elicited the little baby to hatch. So it started to come out, and it's a great video of this too. Um, it started to come out, and then there was this like Godzilla Mothra event going on. And they were just fighting each other, and everyone's rooting for the little octopus, of course, right? We're like, oh, octopus. Um, and sure enough, they struggled for about a minute or two, and then the little octopus did get away, happy to report. Uh, but the shrimp went right back, so who knows if he got another, another snack there. We started to see more of them hatch. Here's two of them in the same frame right there. So we're like, man, these guys are popping babies out everywhere. This is great. Uh, and then we left loggers into these, um, 
these pools, these flatter areas, it's much easier to leave equipment on horizontal surfaces as opposed to all the vertical ones, of course. And just some shots of kind of the dense aggregations. This particular population had over 200 just in this site. A uh, nice uh, perspective shot there from Argus. So dive number two, we went along this ridge and we found these sedimentary cliffs that some of them were upwards of 50 meters tall. Um, there was really remarkable um, geology there, structure. It was kind of very Indiana Jones-esque, desert southwest with buttes and plateaus and everything. Uh, but because of the erosive nature of the sedimentary rock, not a lot can attach to it for a long time because it slumps, falls, and erodes off. But still remarkable structures, really cool stuff. There's a shot from the upper ROV. Again, it gives you context for how large these things are. Then uh, we were kind of running out of time, and I wanted to make sure we got to the octocone. So I made the call as we were going along this uh, sedimentary rock area. We still had quite a bit more to go, like a little cul-de-sac. I said, yeah, we, we got to cut it short. I want to make it to the cone. And so um, just like with everything in science, we got wow. lucky. Oh, well, well, oh, 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 baby. Okay, yes. Kate is phenomenal. We can't stop, can we? We, we can stop and come back if you want. Yeah. Yeah. I think, oh, uh, God. Let's yeah. take our time with it, and then we, I think we it's have worth to come it. back anyway. Yeah. So. Video okay. Oh, my God. Excited up here, just right, saying. Yeah. Yes, come yeah. in. Let's go ahead and zoom in. Yeah, dinner is Do served. We have any systems where they do not rely on sunlight as their primary source of energy. It was really, really cool. So we saw that fuzz all over the bones. Um, we had these uh, amphoretid worms, which are these fuzzy things in the mud. This is basically where the whale, um, a lot of the whale blubber probably had melted or dissolved or decayed into the mud itself, um, providing nutrients for these worms. So we collected a lot of those as well. Uh, they're still scavenging. You can see there's still internal organs. There's still some blubber. So these octopus, grenadiers, cusk eels, other things are still there munching on that. The larger scavengers have probably already left after they got all the big blubber. Uh, but people estimate maybe this, this whale fell about four years ago, four months ago uh, prior to this, uh, which is really, really remarkable because whale falls, I'll, I'll get, I think I have a slide of it uh, later, whale falls can last up to 100 years with just their bones. Only about 75 whale falls have been discovered or described in science, and most of them are ones that are many, many years, if not decades old. So they don't really have too much of a community left like this. Uh, most of what's been studied have been whales that have been intentionally sunk. Here in Monterey Bay, Mbari's done that. In other places in the world, they've done that. And then they study that ecological succession over time on how it decays and the different um, you know, uh, times of, of animals that come in. But it's very rare to find not just a whale fall, but a relatively fresh one, and that's natural. And so this is a great opportunity for, for research. But it was a, a trying three hours on site because um, 
we wanted to collect some of the bone-eating worms, but they're in the bone. You can't pull them out. Well, you need a marine mammal permit to collect whale bones. And so we didn't have one. So I was on the phone trying to get a hold of National Marine Fisheries Service. And it took about three hours, but we finally got the verbal authorization uh, to pick up a couple of small um, uh, uh, fin bones, basically. You can see some of the ones that are sitting out in the open. Those are actually its uh, rear limbs. Uh, they have these vestigial rear limbs that are inside their body because, of course, they evolved from land animals. And so they still retain some of those um, leg bones in the back. So those are really, really cool. Even more nuts. Right Get now. on the live feed. There's a shot. Now, this is a relatively small whale. That ROV is about two and a half meters long. So you can see maybe this whale was about five meters long or so. Some more shots in case the video didn't work. Really cool one there of the skull. It landed upside down. So this is a, a ventral view of it. It's a, a view of its belly. Its belly is up. Okay. Here's a close-up of those bone-eating worms. Really, they're actually kind of pretty, even though they sound very ghastly. Some of this, the uh, other... Uh, there's still some um, arterial structure here, maybe from the, art, the heart or something. Uh, some organs still sitting there. Um, I won't go into the eco ecological succession of a whale fall, but uh, there is a period in which scavengers come in, then the bone-eating worms set in for several years, and then there's still a community there for up to you know, maybe 20 years after. So whale falls are a bonanza, and it's one thing that wasn't even realized until 1987 uh, when the first one was documented via sub. And we've all known about marine snow, things that just fall down the water column. That's the primary source of carbon and energy for the deep sea. But these provide such an episodic bonanza of food. It's, uh, it's estimated it's about 200 years worth of food all at once in that local area. So it's very important. Um, uh, way to go. So, like I said, they can last up to uh, 100 years or more. Uh, our whale fall was around four months, about 75 in the world. And on average, you might find one every 12 kilometers within the shipping lanes of uh, the United States and other par parts of the world. Uh, but that number is, is going to fluctuate depending where you are. So it's still very, very rare to find them because, um, again, we're with an ROV and the width of our beam is about the width of this uh, row of people right here. And so to run into one of these things is pretty remarkable. It, I mean, something could just be off to the side and you wouldn't see it. So we hit that octopus cone, we call it now. Uh, and as we were coming up the side, uh, I was just hoping we'd find some seeping. We finally did find a warm water seep, but there were no octopus in it. And so we thought that was really unique and peculiar. We hadn't found a seep yet without octopus in it. Uh, but it was like, just drive to the top. We got a feeling, I got a feeling, and then we get to this top of all this pillow lava, this is volcanic cone, it's really beautiful, and then we started to see dozens of them all lined up, going down in these rows, these ribbons of octopus again. So once again, it was the last 45 minutes of a 30-hour dive that we discovered this, and it's like, I gotta, we gotta discover these things earlier in the dive so we have more time. But we did, we did hit it, we did discover it, so now we've established there are two, at least, uh, octopus gardens, and they are about six miles apart from one another, so they're not like right next door, which is great. There's a shot from up above, so again, the outreach uh, that Ocean Exploration Trust puts together is incredible. They have a, a wonderful uh, press release um, system. They got uh, you know, education and, and outreach uh, and PR people on board. We have these live interactions. So that, that video in the upper top there, the upper right was the whale fall. It's already got over 1 point whatever million, sorry, 5.8 million views on all platforms. Um, Amity took care of a lot of our ship to shore live interactions. So that's a picture of me and Dr. Amanda Kahn in that room in the lower right. And so we would broadcast live to classrooms, museums, and other things. And then, so it'd be a just question and answer period live on the ship. I did one for my son's uh, uh, classroom uh, and even my daughter the year before that. So that was really kind of special to talk to their classroom live uh, from this ship. Uh, it's just incredible um, outreach they have there. Uh, as far as the octopus garden itself, I get really excited about it, but it's really cool to see things like CNN, National Geographic, NPR doing stories on it. Uh, and in fact, Smithsonian Magazine said 18 things we've learned about the oceans in the last decade as the decade just closed. And they used our octopus garden as their cover shot, and we were one of the 18 things they've learned from the ocean. So it's really cool to see that kind of publicity get out there about this stuff. Uh, we 
did take a lot of samples. They have a full wet lab aboard. And what's really great about all the people I worked with is while we were on site, let's say at the whale fall, I'm not a bone eating worm expert. I'm like, what do I do? How do I collect this? Well, I got put in touch with two doctors down in Occidental and um, Scripps, and they were able to text back and forth with me, watch it live, and then tell me, yeah, get that bone, get that piece of mud, slurp up that, put it in ethanol, put it in formalin, put it on ice in the minus 80. And it was great. I had virtual experts with me, um, so I was able to get that. So we have a lot of samples for a lot of other scientists that requested them, and they are all uh, have been shipped out uh, to them. And then as far as the bone-eating worms, I've been working with Dr. Shannon Graffetti from Occidental, and we have confirmed officially it is a new species of Ocidex that was on the, the whale. So that's really, really cool, because there's only like 27 or 28 that are described right now, uh, and so we got another new one. So we're going to be describing that. Uh, later this year, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute will be taking their uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. They look like little underwater subs that are driven by robots, essentially. Well, they're robotic, they're, they're artificial intelligence. And they get really close to the seafloor. And so we can only do multi-beam mapping from the surface. The beam that you shoot out gets wider and wider the deeper you go. That means it's lower resolution for the pictures you get. Well, these AUVs can now fly very close to the seafloor and get centimeter resolution for the multi-beam. They also have a camera aboard and can actually image the seafloor. And we can put it together in a photo mosaic. So this could be a potential way to find more of these octopus gardens prior to going out and exploring and just hoping for the best. We can send this out to suspected targets. They come back with the data. We can review it and go, oh, there is octopus here, or there is an octopus there. And then we can go back later with the ROV to check it out. So we do have confirmed time. We just learned a couple weeks ago. We're going to be on the Nautilus again in September of this year. So we're going to go out to the original octopus garden, collect all of those loggers I mentioned. So that's going to be a lot of valuable uh, data. And we're going to explore additional targets uh, for those octopus sites. So again, why is all this research important? Uh, besides it being brand new to science, or relatively brand new to science, uh, we want to know some of the things like, does the warm water act as a cheat code for reproduction? So the warmer the water is, the theory is it's going to speed up the metabolism and development of the eggs. So that could be good for the octopus in terms of just more babies per year and also lower their uh, chance of being preyed upon by those shrimp and other things. If you're there for less time, you have less chance of being preyed upon. Um, Davidson Seamount itself may support many more oct octopus nurseries by acting as this conduit uh, for seawater that is warmed up by the earth. So maybe not just a place that harbors uh, amazing coral and sponge life, but now might actually act indirectly as a way to support these nurseries. Uh, and that's a great new story to tell about our area and certainly for the sanctuary. You know, we, all, we always hear about sea otters and kelp and great white sharks and the migration of humpbacks and gray whales and all these wonderful things. But this is a brand new story I think would be really, really interesting to tell if we do discover that. So if this is true, maybe many other seamounts could be supporting nurseries uh, and other diverse uh, collections of organisms. Because again, no one typically looks at the base of mountains, the base of seamounts. Everybody wants to look up at the top. So this is, uh, I think, going to increase maybe the chances of, of looking at the bases of seamounts. And then, of course, confirmation of additional seamounts maybe having these octopus nurseries or other uh, supporting other aggregations of animals uh, may lead to further protection of seamounts around the world, which is important with the advancing of um, deep sea mining technology and other things like that. So I just want to say a quick thank you. Um, I know I'm just about out of time. But definitely Ocean Exploration Trust and the crew and Dr. Bob Ballard, uh, sanctuary staff and leadership, the BBC, Woods Hole, who runs the Atlantis, and of course the Alvin crew, which took really good care of me, Dr. Jason Sylvan, who agreed to add those four days to that cruise, Paul Michelle, whom you heard of uh, speak up here earlier, was in full support, as well as our regional manager, Bill Duros, uh, my boss, Dr. Dr. Andrew DeVogler, who's the research coordinator for the sanctuary. Dr. Jeff Wheat and Annie Hartwell, who were invaluable in providing all of that seawater chemistry equipment. Annie came aboard with us this past year and was able to execute all that work. Uh, Dr. Janet Voigt, she's a cephalopod expert at the Food Museum of National uh, History in Chicago, and she's been helpful. We did collect uh, a female and, and sent it out to her so she could positively identify the species. Uh, and it, I didn't mention it earlier. It's Musoctopus robustus. So no common name, but that's just... That's it. Uh, Dr. Jim Berry, who we've been working with for years, going out to Davidson and more recently Sir Ridge, 
for these coral studies. We've been doing a lot of translocation coral studies where we're clipping off branches of deep sea coral, bringing them up, putting them in hockey pucks of underwater cement, putting them back down, and putting them out in different areas to see if they survive. And we have individual corals now that have survived over six years after that translocation stuff. But once he got worried about this octopus garden stuff, he was like, can we go there? I was like, yeah, of course we can go there. <laughs> These things are expensive. You have the money. Let's go. We don't have the money. Um, Dr. Mana Khan, who was formerly at Ambari, uh, she now runs the invertebrate zoology lab at Moss Landing Marine Labs, which is actually where I went uh, in, in the invertebrate zoology lab. She took over for Dr. John Geller. Uh, of course, Amity, uh, she was on both cruises and provided just wonderful um, educational and outreach uh, uh, work. Uh, she was invaluable. Uh, Erica Burton, who also works with me on the research team, Dayton Harden, we actually collected some water from the deep sea to look for um, things like PCBs, flame retardants, uh, and other um, persistent organic pollutants. Those things are going to be tested here in March. They're going to actually be analyzed. And so much like the Ambari work where they looked at microplastics in the deep, we're looking at the, um, this uh, persistent organic material that does not degrade in the ocean that comes from land. And we want to see if it's all the way out there. Uh, and then, of course, my wife who couldn't be here today uh, and my two kids are over here. They've been very, very supportive because it's a lot of days at sea and, and it's rough juggling the family of two full-time jobs. But uh, anyway, thank you. I can take a few questions. Okay. Yeah? Okay, good. coming around, so um, if you do have a question, just raise your hand. And so in the octopus gardens, is the energy source at the base of the food chain chemical in that area, or is it still stuff that's coming down from above? Oh, the, ma the majority is still going to be the stuff that's coming down from above. Um, you know, the octopus themselves, what females do is once they brew their eggs, that's all they do until they die. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, any longer consume any food, so they don't have to worry about energy input. Uh, but we, what we don't know is the other animals in that immediate seep community, there might be some bacteria in there, some hydrosulfide-loving bacteria in that area. We haven't done the test for it. We haven't done the collections for it. Probably not. Um, but other than that, all the other areas are still, you know, very dependent on what's falling down. Hi. Um, do we know? I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, do we know if these, if this octopus species are terminal breeders? And two, do we know where the males are? Um, the males, uh, I didn't show you any video there, but we do see them coming around. They have a modified third arm with the reproductive uh, appendage on the end of it. So if they're showing that, uh, it's really easy to determine if it's a male or not. So we do see them lurking around. And I'm always like, I think these ladies are all taken right now. <laughs> they already have eggs. Uh, but we do see them uh, wandering around. I'm sorry, what was your first question? You, what do you mean by terminal breeders? Oh. Yeah, yeah, terminal isn't death, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we do, uh, we have seen a couple of females and males that were senescing. And those are the ones, by the way, we did collect. We didn't collect the nice, healthy ones. Um, so they were on their way out. But yeah, after their eggs hatch, and we don't know the amount of time, but they do go into senescence and then, and then die. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just curious um, with the whale fall and the um, decomposers that are working on it, what's that compared to the um, whales that you get in Monterey Bay and you drag out to sea and you watch them fall? What's the difference in what feeds on those compared to what's feeding on that whale fall? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't been a part of the Ambari research in dropping. I think their one is called Rosebud is the one that they drop. Uh, but the, 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 the limited research I've done is really there's no difference between them except um, certainly the, some of the species of Ossidax are different. They've, they've found up to three or four different species on the same whale itself, which is really interesting. Uh, but as far as the ecological uh, succession of the scavengers that come in and then the bone-eating worms and the smaller scavengers, uh, that seems to follow a pretty constant, you know, rate of change, I, I guess you could say. But I don't know of any other major differences between what you'd call an artificial fall versus a natural fall. Oh, yeah. 
I see you, Carol. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for all you're doing. Uh, I have a question that you, you mentioned just briefly about um, the shipping lanes, and that is where the whale falls mm -hmm. are often found every 12 kilometers, I think you said. Are you implying perhaps that they are being struck? I, I'm not implying that, but it absolutely is a rational um, conclusion that some of the whale falls may be whale strikes. I think um, we've determined, I mean, a, lo a lot of the whales that end up on the beach when they undergo, uh, undergo a necropsy can be determined if there was a whale strike. But think about all the whales that don't end up on the beach that can't be recovered, it can't be studied. Yeah. Exactly. So if we're finding them along the beach, it's reasonable to conclude that some of them are sinking without ever being seen. Um, so I, I do think that's likely. As far as how much it increases the number of whale falls, I, I couldn't even presume to guess. You know, it could be marginal, could be a decent amount, but with most whales just dying naturally, you know, I, I couldn't say. Um, the, I have one last question, and it's just the size of this particular octopus and they're white, so they're white because it's dark. Are they able to change color? Yeah, we actually, uh, the one we collected, we looked under dissecting scope for the chromatophores, and they have chromatophores, but they don't have any real capacity to change. So as far as we can tell initially, they don't change color at all, like your tropical ones or your GPOs. But again, like you just suggested, it's dark down there, so really changing your color isn't gonna do much, um, and they don't, um, photofluoresce or biofluoresce or anything like that. And they're about the size, they're just their mantle, is about the size of a softball, 12 inch softball. Uh, with, well, with, with the arms, you know, maybe you know, up to a two feet, three feet at most, yeah. Thank you. Is that, okay, yeah. thank you. All right, thanks Chad. Um, if you do have more questions, I'm sure he'll be around and happy to answer them for you. So thank you so much, Chad.